Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Barely Bookish Podcast. Today we are going to be continuing on with Kindred, so if you haven't listened to the first couple episodes, please be sure to go do that first. Uh, just so that one, everything's in order for you, and two, um, that way you don't miss anything. Also, if you haven't read Kindred, if you want to make sure you avoid spoilers, do that first. Uh, and then come back and hang out with us and talk about Kindred with us. Um... Also, there is a lot of content warnings that I shared in the first episode, so make sure that you at least listen to that or Google the content warnings on your own, um, just because I don't want anybody to have any um, issues, um, even though this is like a really good book and I think it's really worth the read. I just want to make sure everyone's in the right headspace to kind of hear everything that goes on. Uh, also, I'm going to be trying to do more streams over on Twitch, so if you haven't checked out the Twitch yet, please do. Also, this month on Patreon on Friday, uh, we will be covering The Witcher with my friend Megan. Um, that's going to be a lot of fun. It'll be both season one and season two. So if you want to avoid P Witcher spoilers, make sure you watch The Witcher first um, and then you can join us for Patreon. Uh, and that exclusive episode is at patreon.com slash barelybookish and you get uh, access to everything. It's all donation based. So for just $3 a month, you get the whole backlog as well as every monthly episode that comes out after. But uh, I hope you all enjoy this episode, and let's get right into it. Dana, you know, being our only logical person again in this entire book and the relationship is like, hey, you do realize that this means when I get teleported back, you have to be within arm's grasp. Like, you have mm -hmm. to grab me again. And he's yep. like, oh, I didn't really think about that. Like, of course, you didn't think about that, Kevin. Of course, you didn't. Because you're dumb. Yeah. Like, the easiest, like, it's so simple to have not done that and like there's no guarantee that they will be near each other when she gets teleported back completely true and then like he also starts to complain like right away like this lady is in a time period that is literally like literally everything is trying to kill her mm -hmm. in this time period like it's like australia but all the time yep. and everywhere just and everything is <laughs> yeah man it's like not safe at all mm -hmm. and he's like nim homesick and i'm like shut up yeah. You can live like a king here. You don't say how how horrible this is. Be quiet. He's, Just shush and sit down and put your hands in your pockets and think about what you've done. He gives Enough me vibes of, of like a rich kid going to a like poor person's house. And he's like, what if you just got another job? You know, like that's yeah. what he's doing right now. That's exactly what it is. Why did he have carpet instead of like hardwood floors? Ew. Like, shut up. <laughs> You're like, wow, I wish I could afford that. You know? Yeah. Ew, your parents take the bus. Ew. Why don't you just get a car? Ew, your parents. Read the like, room. <laughs> make you work. Weird. Yeah. Horrible. Ugh. I do think it's interesting, though, how scared Rufus is of his dad, like, coming. Like, when they start talking about, like, how someone needs to fix his leg. Yeah. Like, he loses his mind thinking yeah. about his dad showing up. And I'm like, well, who is this bigger, more gigantic asshole? And then when Tom does show up and him, he's immediately like, oh, <laughs> this is going to cost me so much money. Yeah. <laughs> Not the time. <laughs> Not the time, Tom. Like, no. first of no. all, you're getting free labor. So... Listen, I look at that and I'm like, Tom, do you and Kevin already know each other? You have very similar vibes. <laughs> oh, oh my God. He married her to be a slave. Ew. Ew. It was like dangling right in front of me and I didn't really fully put that together. Like we, we skirted around it, but ow. Right. Ah, like basically he married her to make him. Like, it's the exact same thing that they're doing right now, except he's doing it in 1976 because he married right. her. Right. And, like, he doesn't see it as slavery because he's like, oh, well, we're both free and we're both equal and mm -hmm. we're both, you know, on the level. Like, we're we're a partnership, we're a relationship, we're a couple. But, like, he still expects her to do more for him than he does for her. Yep. And except he's which, like is a power imbalance yeah and he's like well i'm gonna go into my office while you unpack the rest of the house mm -hmm. yep <sighs> <laughs> he's the 
fucking worst. Yeah. So then Tom takes them to his house after Rufus like begs them to come to his home. Mm-hmm. And uh she he's like, So where are you guys from? And she's like, We're from New York. And he Tom does not like this at all. No, not at all. I don't know why she would pick New York of all places when they're in the deep south. Because like she knows that New York is like a liberal like Mecca. Yeah. And so that would explain why she's you know educated why she Mm. talks the way she does why she's because like she can't say she has a california accent he doesn't know that he thinks it's spanish Mm -hmm. you know what i mean so like all she can say is like well where do i know that's like the most free and she's like oh new york then yeah and like he immediately has like a very strong reaction Mm -hmm. and to me i like when the second that i saw that he kind of like wrinkled his nose at that and was kind of like grossed out by that or whatever i was like oh okay so this guy has a problem with the fact that she's from a free state Mm-hmm. and that like and, and not not just where she's from but also like how she presents herself too. the fact that she like looks him in the eye mm-hmm. you know what i mean and i think it was smart of her to at least think in the moment like where would where is a good place to say that she's from where she could get away with just more being herself instead of having to be extra careful all the time mm-hmm. um because like obviously if you're not used to living that lifestyle, you're going to slip up. You know what I mean? Like a lot of those slaves, the only reason that they, you know, Kanye West was like, Oh, well at, at a certain point you must want to be a slave or whatever, which like, I will never forgive that man for that. Um, oh, yeah. But like the reason that it really impacted me is, is because it's like, you know, you're, you're in a situation where somebody has, cause again, this isn't even the beginning of slavery. Like, mm-hmm. so these are people who were born, all of them, like even the older slaves were born into slavery. Mm-hmm. And like, even when you think about the process, right, you have these gigantic ships that are carrying like hundreds of thousands of people sometimes mm-hmm. as cargo. Um, they're crammed together so that you're like pushed up right next to the person next to you. People are getting seasick. There's nowhere for that seasickness to go. You're just laying in it. Mm-hmm. People have to go to the bathroom. There's nowhere for that to go. You're just laying in it. So like people are giving birth. People are dying. People are wounded. People are fighting. People are, you know what I'm saying? Like all together in these teeny tiny closed quarters, like livestock, Mm -hmm. you know, like it wasn't even like you could sit up. Many cases they had you strapped down and prone for the entire duration of this, of this trip. And we're talking like months at sea. We're not even saying like, oh, it's like a week. I mean, after a week on a cruise ship where you can like eat you're to your heart's content and get massages every day and just kind of generally fuck off and have a nice time. Mm-hmm. Even after seven days on a cruise, I'm like, all right, is this over? Is this done? Are we good? Yeah. Can I go? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I can't imagine being like stuck there. And there were a whole crew. There were whole ships of people that like, once they were free, just threw themselves and their babies, their children, their infants into the sea because they were like, it's better than this. Like yeah. anything is better than this. So you have that trauma, right? That this entire race of people experience. And then they come to America and there's a new trauma of your body isn't yours. Your mind isn't yours. You belong to someone else, even though like they didn't belong to anybody before that. And even the few that did, like there were some warriors that had taken over, you know, Kings that had taken over like other tribes and kept them as slaves and everything. But it was more like slaves, like servants, not slaves. Like because you are black, Mm -hmm. you are inferior and we're going to treat you as inferior. They were still people. They were just people who were owned. Right Mm -hmm. here. It's in America. It's been, Oh no, these are, these are your things. These are objects. They're Mm -hmm. not people right that was part of what like allowed this to go on for so long so you now have like i mean i think that that slavery i know in america like 1600s right 1700s Mm -hmm. so this is like almost 200 years already that slavery has been a thing in america by the time dana gets there so like that to me is what really blows my mind about how like old this is Mm -hmm. and how like all of these people already have an understanding you know what i mean like they don't have options they've been born into this and even when they try to rebel like we saw with alice's husband Mm -hmm. like they get sold they get their family you know murdered Mm -hmm. somebody's forced to be somebody's concubine like there's there's swift and and brutal punishments for this and dana's like well how can i avoid that because i'm bound to say something Mm -hmm. i'm bound to do something that's not going to be right you know what i mean even in the moment when she's talking to him she like tries to remember to like cast her like avert her eyes Mm -hmm. because she realizes that she can't just like step to him Mm -hmm. the way that she would just step to anybody in her normal life. You know what I mean? She, she has to be passive Mm -hmm. and her husband is like seeing all of this. And even then doesn't seem entirely sold 
that this is a problem. And like these other slaves are like, we live in fear every day that we are going to get split up. We live in fear every day that someone is going to like disappear and never return either because they were killed and murdered or because they were sold off. Like we live in fear every day that like something's going to happen to our bodies that we do not agree with. You know, even Nigel, like Nigel is a little kid who is like Rufus's appointed friend, which like, how does that make either person better? Because the little boy is the slave to another little boy. Right. And he has to pretend he likes him all the time. But then this little boy, Rufus, also doesn't have real friends. So how is he supposed to learn how to be like a normal part of society? Like he gets everything he wants. And then he has this friend that's not really a friend. And then he has Alice, who's not really a friend. Yeah. Like, (laughs) to me, I'm just, I'm like looking at this like nightmare just going like, man, there's like no, there's like no good way out of this. And now Kevin's there and he's like, well, this isn't so bad so far. This is, you know, I do want to go home. This is kind of a drag. It is a bummer, but like. Truly the Could be worse, right? He's the worst. And she's like, it is worse. Yeah. She's like, this is literally the worst. (laughs) This is it. (laughs) So they finally get to the house. You know, and Tom just like dumps Rufus on the bed because he doesn't care about his child whatsoever. <laughs> and he's just like, I'm fully imagining him just like basically, you know, like when your older sibling just is really mad about like carrying you and then just like fully yeah, just throws you. <laughs> yeah. Moves arms away instead of like gently setting. Yes. With a broken leg of all yeah. things too. Does not care. Nope. And then Rufus's mom comes in and she like recognizes Dana, but like hasn't fully placed how, Mm -hmm. which I've been there. She's a lot. She is a lot. She's a lot as a person. Like she comes Mm -hmm. in like, I don't know, on 12. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And like, it's pretty obvious that he knows exactly how to work her. Like from that very first scene, like she comes rushing in or whatever. And she like screams and like gets all up in Dana's face. And then Rufus like, is pretend sleeping in is like mother and she's like my baby and then that's the end of it like she doesn't even like look at her again she's just like zoom (laughs) i honestly kind of love that for rufus because like it's so helpful i mean for dana it is yeah you know (laughs) like it's like the opposite of an attack dog what is that like a distract a cat (laughs) distract a cat like that (laughs) i just i can't imagine if Dana was not a part of Rufus's life at all what Rufus would have been like because it can't be good no not at all and I think that like that unceremonious kind of drop that Tom does to to Rufus into the bed Mm -hmm. like she makes a point to say like I don't know if it's that he didn't realize he was being rough but it seemed like he just didn't care Mm -hmm. like there's like a general lack of care and 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 lack of concern for anyone outside of oneself Mm-hmm. for all people involved except for like margaret because she actually cares about her son but she cares about her son in like an obsessive way as an extension of herself rather than loving him like for himself so i think that dana also kind of gives him that autonomy mm-hmm. that he needs because his father seems more or less ambivalent toward him mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah i agree i think i don't know it's just such a weird connection i'm still trying to figure out how his parents even got together like they are very different very (laughs) well i guess rufus's mom is his second wife yes yes she is well that's the thing i think the first time it sounds like he really when he talks about his ex-wife like he revered Mm -hmm. her Mm -hmm. you know he talks about how she was really good-hearted she was real kind she was very sweet polite Mm -hmm. um and it kind of gave me the sense that like maybe that's that's part of what's causing this problem because he he would have had like if he had had a child with his first wife Mm -hmm. that would have been a different child than rufus might have turned out to be being as spoiled as he is by Mm. this second wife you know and i think that you know like seeing how kind of gruff and stern tom is it makes me wonder like what his what his parentage was like you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. like what were his parents like toward him like were they even less careful you know what i mean or is it, you know, something more like, you know, he just is doing what he knows? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, there's really no telling, like, what's making this person tick. Um, but it's pretty clear that he has only, like, the only the effect on his son to to have him fear him, yeah. really. 
rather than like an actual bond and the bond that he has with his mom like both of his parental bonds are like quid pro quo kind of you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. with his dad it's just straight up negative and then with his mom like with his dad it's negligence and then with his mom it's like smothering yeah i'm really hoping and i'm like trying to manifest that rufus breaks the cycle here because i i really really want to hope that rufus and alice's relationship is one of love Mm -hmm. but i'm scared and nervous yeah i actually think that that's a very interesting like plot device that she's using Mm -hmm. because like the the reader knows at least to a minimum about slavery right Mm -hmm. that it happened that it was bad national shame etc but like opening this book right recognizing that like understanding what the mission is understanding that she has dana has no control over being you know thrust into the past and she's being asked to save someone who is her ancestor like leaving that open to the the reader for such a long time is is pretty brave because Mm -hmm. again like we're left to kind of draw our own conclusions until we get there Mm -hmm. and it's just sitting open you know what i mean like every page i turn it and i'm like is there more information about the nature of this relationship i'm really invested in alice and rufus working out in a way that doesn't suck but at the Mm -hmm. same time this whole time period really sucks so i feel like maybe i'm getting ahead of myself (laughs) i know i'm just like i just want to hope and i'm yeah. so scared i'm like i you know it's hard too because it's like right at this point in the book they're children like he's not even thinking about like marrying her and having children with yep. alice you know so it's like we have no idea where his headspace is yeah but i do think it's interesting too like the fact that he has dana to teach him about the future and instill this to in him mm-hmm. and like the other hard part is like because his dad forced slaves to be his friends rufus actually legitimately probably thinks these are his friends you know like these are the people he confides in so like obviously he's gonna build relationships with like like the slaves you know yeah and like look at them differently than how his dad would because you know his dad probably had white kid friends but like rufus doesn't right i mean that's that's something that also kind of is striking to me too is that like you know like you said like he has slave children who are his friends Mm -hmm. um and obviously those aren't your real friends they are your friends because your dad owns their family and owns Mm -hmm. them Mm -hmm. which is obviously not a friendship um but he he does not realize that it doesn't seem like he understands that that kind of um the burden that they have Mm -hmm. of him as a person yeah you know what i mean and when he when dana asks when dana and kevin asks you know who do you talk to about this He's like, well, nobody would believe me, but I talked to Nigel, Mm -hmm. you know, and Nigel obviously is a slave boy that works for the family. So, Mm -hmm. you know, he is in like this unique position to be kind of seeing both sides of Mm -hmm. things. And one of the things that I really like, too, about this book is that um, Butler gets like allows us to spend time, like a little bit of time with with all of the characters of color. Like we get Mm -hmm. to kind of see the back end of, you know, these enslaved people telling her like, hey, be careful. Hey, we've been there. Hey. Mm-hmm. We know that right now this seems like, you know, you're new here. Mm-hmm. You, you're you just being yourself, but be careful. And, like, I think the craziest thing to me is that, like, Rufus tells her to be careful. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, if he's saying be careful, then to some extent he knows that the world he lives in and this inequity is bad, mm-hmm. that it's inherently wrong, mm-hmm. or else he wouldn't have told her to be careful. He would have just gone, okay, well, if she gets her just dessert, she's going to be the way she's going to be yeah so that's why i'm really holding out hope yeah crossing my fingers and my toes because (laughs) i i really want to see a good rufus i don't want him to become another tom yeah same same and it'll be really easy for him to do so Mm -hmm. i mean his cards are stacked in that direction but i'm just kind of hoping he knocks them all over same so rufus's mom kicks out uh dana even though rufus is like hey please hang out in here with me and she's like no get out of here because i don't know i think honestly she probably views dana as a threat even before the stuff that happens later in this chapter but um because she smothers her son and she wants her son to only love her Mm -hmm. little little emotional incest but you know yeah well i mean i think part of that too is the resentment that her husband has for her 
Yeah. Like it's not as though he respects her. And yeah. I think that like so when I was when I was doing um African New World studies as a mm-hmm. minor in mm-hmm. college, um, and then English as a major and women's studies as my double major, like obviously there's a lot of intersectionality there. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting to kind of study like the hierarchy of you know abuse mm-hmm. right in the world and if you ever read um uh native son right um that book is basically about this very idea of like how i met your mother actually calls it the chain of screaming <laughs> um basically the idea that like everybody has somebody that like digs at them that like messes with them Mm -hmm. and then they in turn go and mess with somebody else to relieve that stress right so you know in in today's world you might have like you know the ceo of a company is the top dog he doesn't report to anybody maybe it's private company there's no shareholders Mm -hmm. he's having a bad day so he screams at his employee that employee goes home screams at his wife that wife goes home and screams at the kids Mm -hmm. the kids punch a kid on the bus the next morning right Mm -hmm. so that kind of domino effect of poor behavior Mm -hmm. But like in this scenario, it's even crazier to me because I feel like, you know, the impact is is worse. So you've got Tom Whalen, who is I mean, the, the slaves even tell her they tell Dana, hey, he's not he doesn't like educated slaves. Mm-hmm. He doesn't like educated black people like you need to tone it down. You know, you can be however you are out here, but you can't be like that inside. Inside, you need to like cast your eyes aside. Like, don't look him in the face. Don't refer to him, you know, as anything other than, you know, sir or master or whatever. Like there's very strict rules Mm -hmm. to be able to like live in this community right in this world um so yeah so basically you have uh you have tom who feels you know who feels put upon by you know wealthier more educated white men than him so because he feels put upon he then acts out toward everybody so he treats his wife like she's an infant like she's Mm -hmm. he infantilizes her and treats her like You know, like she doesn't matter and her opinions, you know, don't really matter. He's very, you know, like arm's length with his wife. Mm -hmm. Then he kind of like lords over Kevin a little bit, trying to like steal his slave out from under him. You know what I mean? And like eyeing what that guy is trying to do. Um, And then you see how he reacts towards his son, right? Where he doesn't even bother dealing with Rufus. And even when he does, it's like a mix of uh, like a like a teeny like a pinch of love Mm -hmm. and a ton of criticism. So then you have Margaret who's being, you know, put upon by her husband and she can't do that to her son because she loves him. So then she's like ridiculously horrible to the people that work for her in her house. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? She like her pendulum swings the complete opposite direction to just be savage toward these people. And I think that today we still kind of see that like Margaret is like an OG Karen. Yep. There's no manager to talk to, but she would talk to Dana's manager if she could. Like she's she is like, someone. <laughs> go get. I forgot what. Oh, Sarah. She's like, go get Sarah because Sarah's the manager in my head. Yes, yes. Sarah is kind of the manager. That's what I'm saying. So she's like somebody who just can't. Like she's she's she needs to be able to balance her scales, mm-hmm. and the way she does that is by being even more forceful with other people, except for like Kevin and Rufus. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dana leaves the room, and there's a little girl right there who's just like walking around and Dana's like, Hey, uh, can you give me directions? But the little girl couldn't talk for some reason. And then we find out, um, well, we find out later that she actually can't talk at all. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really get explained, but she can hear. So that's good. Like, I don't know if she has like, I don't know if it's called selective. I think she's supposed to. Yeah. I think she's supposed to be mute. Yeah. I don't know if she's she doesn't seem like she's ignorant. Yeah. Or stupid or anything like that. Like she has any kind of mental issue. Mm-hmm. It seems like maybe something's wrong with like her maybe her voice box. Mm-hmm. Cause I mean she does communicate, so it's not even like she has nothing to say, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So I don't know. I I mean, I also kind of wonder if Sarah might have done something to make sure she couldn't talk. Mm-hmm. Like not that I think that sarah's vindictive by any means but she did lose all of her children she did and i i wonder if um i mean i i it's funny because i actually can't remember the details of this Mm -hmm. uh from having read this before Mm -hmm. but we already know that sarah you know is like willing to pretty much do anything for her children after Mm -hmm. realizing that they can be sold off yeah and i think it's really interesting too like the dichotomy of 
the way that Margaret cares for her child and the way that Sarah cares for her child, mm-hmm. right? Um, they're similar in age, like, you know, um, well, I guess Sarah's child's a little bit older than, than Rufus's, but mm-hmm. you see Margaret and she's like obsessed with her son and she like needs to exact control over him and she worries after him all the time and whatever. And all of her worrying is largely superficial because nothing is wrong with her child. Like, he's not in any danger, really. And even if he is, he literally has a guardian angel watching out Mm -hmm. for him, right? Mm -hmm. Unlike most people's children. And then you've got someone like Sarah who has to still live in this shitty situation, still report to people who sold off her children. Mm -hmm. Um, She credits Margaret to being the reason that her kids were sold off as well. Mm -hmm. And... You've got this woman who, like, despite the fact that she has almost no control over her entire situation, exercises as much restraint as possible Mm -hmm. and is more human and more compassionate despite the horrors that are visited upon her and her family daily Mm -hmm. compared to, like, the lady of the house that literally has everything she wants. Like, that's a pretty stark contrast to me in this book. Mm -hmm. It's just, like, the way that, you know, because you know that Sarah doesn't like margaret and you know that margaret doesn't seem to like anybody Mm -hmm. you know but just seeing the way that they care for their kids and and how you know how fiercely protective one mother is and how overreacting another is yeah yeah Mm -hmm. i i really like the relationship of sarah and her child and Mm -hmm. honestly like the way i like that we're getting this point of view because i my experience with books set in this time period before this were like just white people yeah you know and like that's kind of boring i'm gonna be honest because (laughs) you're you're missing half of history at that point yeah i agree with you and i think um to me i feel like there there's there's some shows these days that are doing something similar like i feel like mad men you know when you watch mad men you think it's going to be about the guys on madison avenue and to a certain extent it is but it's also really about the women and the other people that are occupying that space with those men and it's kind of a meditation on who they were and how they affected the people around them Mm -hmm. i feel like this almost does the same thing with the waylands um because you know when we have these scenes where you're in the the cookhouse right like it almost feels like a different i mean it feels like an entirely different world like it feels like a little cocoon like a little bubble of safety mm-hmm. that doesn't exist anywhere else not even alice's house mm-hmm. you know what i mean is <laughs> it seems, feels as safe as the cookhouse does um and there's this automatic sense of like community and camaraderie for dana like in a way mm-hmm. that she didn't experience obviously at alice's house nor did she experience in the Wayland house so you know, I think that being able to focus on how this was, how this happened and how this worked out is amazing because I think, again, this book is is older mm-hmm. and we're now getting lots of different perspectives. But I think even in schools, a lot of people are taught history from like the winner's perspective, you know, or the colonizer's perspective rather than the perspective of the people who actually lived it, you know, which I think is why you have people right now that are like, oh, take down you know, don't take down those statues of these Confederate leaders and don't take down, you know, these reminders of, you know, the Confederate flag and all that stuff mm-hmm. because they're out of touch with what actually happened. Whereas people who are, you know, left behind as survivors of like a trauma of a traumatic accident and all their descendants, they're going to see that completely differently. They're going to see that like, oh no, you know, this is my reality. Like my reality is that my people were humiliated and owned and degraded you know what I mean? And that's what that means to me. So yeah. I really think that, 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 that the cookhouse is kind of like a, like a metaphor for like the larger picture of how kind of slavery is in America and how there's like these two worlds that people live in, you know, this one world. I mean, even Kevin, Kevin eventually is like, you know, it's not that bad here. I wish we could go out West and explore. And Dana's yeah. like, they're doing the same thing to native Americans out West. It's the same thing. Mm-hmm. You're not seeing it because you you're it doesn't affect you. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't know that there's whippings and beatings and rapings and killings because it doesn't affect you and you don't have to look. Mm-hmm. And that's literally, you know, a, me- a metaphor for especially the 1960s and 70s, the civil rights movement mm-hmm. and, and the, the struggle that continues, you know, to, to be fought today. Plus, I think the thing that was interesting to me as well is like, it seems like when she's in the cookhouse, 
she's more vocal than she's ever been with Kevin. Absolutely. So far, at, at Absolutely. least. Absolutely. And I'm like, yeah, she speaks mm. her truth. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Which, like, ooh, you should be truthful with your husband. And that should say everything about the way your relationship's structured. It can't be. Yeah. And I also think it's interesting, too, that, like, they immediately get her and her situation despite not knowing what's happening to her mm -hmm. in a way that her own husband doesn't. Kevin, Kevin <laughs> hate podcast. I said it before and I'll say it like, again. Like, what? <laughs> it was wild to me to read that. I was very surprised. F that guy. Yeah. So I also make a note that, like, Dana really needs to get a dress. Like, someone needs to get her a dress. Dude. Everyone keeps talking about her wearing pants. Like, I'm going to be honest. If that happened to me, still would just go pull out a dress. I don't care what kind it is yeah yeah i feel like Literally i already anything. mentioned that but still i mean i think that like she i kind of wonder if if her if her dressing as a man like makes her feel safe because like pants are harder to mess with maybe but maybe... she can be attacked at like any time yeah i would probably do the good old leggings under a dress situation mm -hmm. just to like have that sense of security in my brain but also you know people wouldn't say anything then <laughs> we're like having these like hard conversations and my cat's like attention mother please <laughs> anyways sarah does call margaret a bitch which i was like excellent perfect thank you <laughs> uh everyone starts asking dana questions and she's like trying to make up as many lies as she can in one moment which i thought was mm -hmm. funny yeah. uh because I feel like she needs a cheat sheet at this point. She does, because she's going to have to refer back to this. Yeah. Like, this is important <laughs> details that she's, yeah. like, making up. She's like, I can fudge it. She's like, eh, no one knows. And I'm like, I think everyone's going to notice. Everybody notices. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they finally reveal to Dana that part of the problem is that she's talking like she's educated, which mm -hmm. we have already talked about, but she didn't know until this moment. Right. <laughs> Something that breaks my heart is that they, when they were talking to her about how she talks and mm -hmm. how she speaks better than a lot of white people do, mm -hmm. right? It like really kind of is a very stark contrast to, I think, what we have been led to believe in this country about slavery. I think a lot of people think that slavery is something, oh, presidents had slaves, mm -hmm. rich people had slaves, but like anybody who had even a little bit of money could have had a slave back then. Mm -hmm. And this book really kind of underscores that, you know, that, um, there was a certain amount of, uh, there was a certain sense of entitlement that white people of this time period felt. Mm -hmm. And instead of, you know, a Nintendo Switch or, you know, an Audi or whatever luxury item that you might have today that's like your bragging rights, your Louboutins, right? Mm -hmm. Instead, it was an actual human person. And that's gross. To me, it feels like the iPhone. You know what I mean? Yeah. It feels like yeah. everyone's got one. Yep. Even people who can't afford one mm -hmm. have one, right? Yeah. And like, that's exactly what this is like, except you're talking about people mm -hmm. and you're treating people as though they're a commodity, as though they're an, an, an object that you own and have control over. Mm -hmm. And like these people, you know, these are people that like, if you look at like history and you look at even the way that African-American and, and, and BIPOC people are portrayed in film and television and media today and the news, mm -hmm. a lot of it is very negative. A lot of it is violent. A lot of it is, you know, ruthless and, you know. Uh, shameless but like to me if that were true slavery wouldn't have lasted that long because they would have all just risen up and murdered everybody mm -hmm. you know it's not that that didn't happen there were t you know, tons of slave revolts both successful and unsuccessful where mm -hmm. a lot of people died but like largely slaves <laughs> died yeah. trying to seek their freedom um but i think that like this book kind of does a good job at giving you that perspective that like literally anybody felt like they could be owner that they, they could own a person mm -hmm. and like obviously it's a myth because you have someone from the future like dana who's black and educated and proud to be mm -hmm. right turned down jobs because she wanted to be able to have the flexibility to write like she's got all these options and she's speaking to people who have no options and they're looking at her and calling themselves the n-word mm -hmm. oh marcia tom doesn't like if uh n-words are smarter than him like mm -hmm. they refer to themselves that way because that's what they've been taught that's all that they know Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And they're stuck in this like never ending, seemingly never ending cycle mm -hmm. of knowing that you're smarter, knowing that you're better, recognizing that you are a person and that you're a human being, 
you know, like Carrie covers her ears. Carrie, Sarah's daughter, she mm-hmm. covers her ears when Rufus is screaming because they're like, you know, trying to 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 you know reset his leg. Mm-hmm. This little girl feels pain and feels anguish and feels empathy with somebody who enslaves her. That's like the very opposite of barbarism. You know, so you're seeing more humanity and more intellect and more intelligence, emotional and actual like education as far as like knowing how to do things, running, you know, running this farmland, you know, trying to assist people in building homes or whatever, right? Giving back to their community. Like you see so much more high level action in the black slaves than you do in the white owners. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's an, an incredible juxtaposition to see like the the warmth and camaraderie outside in the cookhouse and then the coldness and the, 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 the fear and anxiety and, and, and neuroses that lives within the Whalen house. Oh, absolutely. So after a while of being there, Rufus starts to scream, um, which, you know, as we just talked about, he was getting his legs set and everyone's just kind of like very uncomfortable about this. Like, because there's real no soundproofing. They don't have AC, so everything's probably open. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so Rufus eventually stops screaming, and Dana's like, "Oh, he definitely passed out." Mm-hmm. Which, yeah, yeah, I can't imagine 1800s healthcare. Like, no, no. She actually mentions that too. Like, she talks about the flies. Mm-hmm that are everywhere outside and how she's eating this like really gross like corn mash Mm -hmm. like mushy mush and how it's disgusting and then she then they're like oh yeah well we get better food once the people you know inside eat like we get their leftovers and she immediately does the math like okay well it's probably already tainted when they get it Mm -hmm. and then they're using their bare hands people don't wash their hands Mm -hmm. and then someone's gonna pick through it and then give it to all of us like how tainted is this food gonna be so lots of lots of super terrifying you know mm-hmm. I, I would argue horror <laughs> it's horror for me I went I went to um, an event one time that was outdoors and I remember it was on a farm and there were flies everywhere like all over mm-hmm. the dessert table like everywhere and I was like I can't eat any of that yeah no <laughs> yeah I, I can't touch any of that like that freaks me out other people were like it's no big deal no not doing it not touching it were your parents <laughs> also very concerned about the Zika virus in like 20. 20- 14 yes okay i have distinct memories Mm -hmm. about like my mom being like the zika is coming to florida and there's already been cases here and so like flies and mosquitoes are just like no all kinds of pestilence yeah no goes for me i'm like that is too much of my like impressionable years are very concerned about the zika virus okay absolutely listen side note i saw a tiktok video the other day of somebody that had like taken like their soup to go and it didn't seem like they were like necessarily in america it looked like they might have been in like a market type Mm -hmm. situation but regardless this was horrifying Mm -hmm. my mom sent it to me because she likes to increase the number of nightmares i have on a daily Mm -hmm. basis and essentially it's a close-up of this person's soup cup and like you know how there's like a little like steam hole like a little hole to the the steam can escape out of your hot cup of whatever Mm -hmm. So there's like a like a mosquito or like a fly and it's got its like proboscis, but like its back end proboscis, proboscis, Mm -hmm. proboscis in the little hole in the cup. Mm -hmm. And you can see it like laying its like eggs out of its butt inside of this lady's like soup. And they're just like dangling. The eggs are just like dangling like from the little top of the soup. So this person like sloshes Mm. their soup. That's it. And now you take that home and you eat that. No. No. No, Mm-mm. no, Mm-mm. and it was there for like a minute. It was there for like like the video was like two minutes long. This like fly just mm-hmm. like going to town, and when it ends, the fly hasn't fly to, hasn't flown away or anything. The fly is just still there. Like, ew, it's horrible. no, it's horrible, no, thank you, it's horrible. I had bad dreams for like three weeks after that. Man, it wasn't good. Mm. I had a girl tell me when I was a kid that uh, earwigs. The reason they're called that is because they go into your ear and then scramble your brain and her house is infested with them nope nope nope, nope, nope and i was staying the night there i didn't sleep no how could you yeah put toilet paper in your ears yeah yeah (laughs) i was like three seconds away from that uh i can't remember what movie it is but a girl sleeps with a sock on her or like a pantyhose on her face (laughs) 
<laughs> what movie is that? I don't know. Oh no, I don't. know. That's wild that though. Yeah, like she's like never dated someone, and like let them stay the night because she didn't want anyone to know that that's how she sleeps. And the guy's like, "Oh, I'm cool with it. <laughs> like whatever." I can't. I'll figure out what movie it is, and I'll like tell you later. Please, please do. So, uh, Dana and Kevin finally meet up, and they're like, "We need to get our story straight because like." everyone's asking a lot of questions and he can't say that they're from like new hampshire and her so new york you know what i mean Mm -hmm. anyways so kevin says that like he's told tom that he's planning to he told dana he would take her back to new york but he's planning to sell her before they get there and i think the thing that bothers me about this is like it's so vindictive for no reason yeah like why say that nobody asked him to say that he didn't have to say that that has nothing to do with anything. I doubt Tom was like, are you going to sell her? Like, that wasn't yeah. the conversation. No. <laughs> that wasn't the conversation. He volunteered that information. Mm-hmm. And I think that, I mean, it's. I guess it's kind of good that he at least told Dana and was transparent. But, mm-hmm. like, how must that be making her feel? Yeah. That he's, like, kind of used to it already. Yeah. And she's like, oh, that's not bad. It's fine. And I'm like, it, it's a little scared. But then he goes and's like, yeah, I'm going to be Rufus's tutor. Uh and you know that'll be fine and so dana's like yeah let's like try and raise him right which you know again dana's just getting thrown into these situations she never comes up with them Mm -hmm. and i think that's what bothers me yeah so sarah starts teaching her how to cook um because now it's been three days and she hasn't felt dizzy yet which means like they're gonna be stuck there for a minute yeah so after hearing that rufus's mom threw hot coffee at dana kevin's like we need to get out of here and we should try and get uh north and dana's like no we need to teach rufus to be a good person because what i'm gonna get him back here like at this point dana's realized like this is an inevitability like he want like the problem is is like if they went north the next time dana gets pulled back it's still going to be to Rufus. And now they know that she's a runaway slave. Mm-hmm. So like Kevin coming ruined this. Yeah. No yeah. ifs and or but. I mean, I will say there is like a temporary reprieve that he offers her, especially because like she starts to kind of set up shop in her room, mm-hmm. uh, in his room. Mm-hmm. Like she starts to kind of, you know, uh, start sleeping in kevin's room so that she won't have to sleep like on the pallet with the rest of you know the people that 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 are enslaved and you know you see you you do see her starting to kind of like make little changes that she's only able to to get done because kevin is with her you know what i mean otherwise she would just be completely exposed like even now anything that she does at this point in the book anyway anything that she does um they can chalk up to her owner Mm mm-hmm and her owner is right there for them to see. So she speaks yeah. a certain way. Well, so does he. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I think if I honestly think that if she had had a, to- a conversation with Tom Whalen or Margaret before bringing Kevin, like without Kevin mm-hmm. there, that would have been a harder truth to yeah. face for them than like, oh, this guy just thinks it's fine for his his slave to be educated. You know what yeah. I mean? Because like, it's not as though that's unheard of. You know what I mean? Like Phyllis Wheatley was a slave. She was very well read. She was an author and a poet. So, you know, I think that it's, 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 it's hard because, you know, for their relationship, it's really terrible that he came because she's like, you make yourself sound disgusting. Mm-hmm. Like you make yourself sound revolting. And he's like, oh yeah, I just want to see if I can make myself somebody that, you know, Tom Whalen won't want around his son. Mm-hmm. But it's like, you're just thinking, he's just thinking about himself. He's not considering the consequences for his actions. Mm-hmm. Like if he makes himself somebody that, that Tom Whalen doesn't need around anymore, then that puts her out there on front street. Yep. You know what I'm saying? So like, he's not, he's not really thinking any of this through. It's almost like he feels like he's like in some kind of surreal play mm-hmm. instead of recognizing that his, every single decision he makes has, you know, a ramification mm-hmm. has like a, has a, you know, a, a result attached to it i know this entire part of this book makes me terrified for the next part yeah because there's no guarantee kevin will come back with her none so kevin's like hey how about we try and scare you home which terrifies me yeah 
because I'm like because he's so reckless like what yeah. is he gonna cook up <laughs> yeah which I want to I'm gonna put a pin in this because I want to talk about it again in a second so Kevin makes Dana move into his room mm-hmm. and he's like yeah Margaret's trying to sleep with me yeah which like disgusting I mean it makes sense because she's somebody who feels slighted by her husband mm-hmm. and she kind of it's like an open secret to everybody that Kevin sleeps with Dana mm-hmm. so she's like I'm better than her yeah I just but, think, like, like she's such a trash person that that's what makes it disgusting yeah she totally is too especially because like this is her husband's household so mm-hmm. if they get caught the chances are he's going to bear more of the blame than her. And yeah. you know that she's not, she doesn't seem like the type that's going to be like, it was all my idea. Yeah. Now she'll be like, it was him. <laughs> yep. He broke into my room. That's like, could you imagine like cheating at your family home of all places? No, that's wild. Like fuck wild. First of all, don't <laughs> condone cheating, but also no. like just like a step worse. Yeah. Yeah. Especially like, in a room next to your son's room? Yeah. That's pretty extreme. A little bit. Sounds terrible. <laughs> so Rufus wanted to see Dana, so she comes up to his room and he's like, hey, could you read me these letters? Like, wouldn't it be fun? And then, uh, you know, everyone finds out she can read and they're like, no, the horror. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, I think that like what makes it so bad that she can read is that everybody else has a hard time doing so. Mm-hmm. Like Margaret doesn't really read. Tom doesn't really read. Rufus doesn't really read. And like Tom makes Rufus feel bad about the fact that he can't read because he himself is not a good reader. Mm-hmm. Like it's a lot. Yeah. And I find it interesting that, you know, like, like again, the, the white people are, are horrified that she knows how to read. They, I mean, even looking at her, looking at the books is too much. Her just being in the same room with the book. They're like, all right, all right, all right enough but like the people that you know the people that are working for them like these people that are you know enslaved they're like oh my gosh Mm -hmm. look at you you rock star also we can't be associated with you because you're dangerous yeah (laughs) they're looking at her like she's some kind of revolutionary like this is the coolest thing ever but also yeah yeah this is dangerous i think the thing that's kind of interesting to me too is like the fact that rufus's first wife was very well read and he specifically made sure that Margaret wasn't. Oh yeah, yeah. Tom's yeah. Tom's first wife is definitely. Oh, that's what I meant. She used to because it was her library, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think I, I kind of wonder if that's because he would get jealous, like with as little care as he shows Rufus. I wonder if he was like needy, mm-hmm. his first wife, and she spent all her time in there, and she was because they because even even the people that are enslaved are like, well, she was really nice. Yeah, she had a heart of gold. She was always sweet to us. Like, she sounds like the complete antithesis of who Tom Whalen is. So even though I think he loved her, like, it's clear that he loved her since, like, he keeps her rooms and stuff like that still in the house. Mm-hmm. And Margaret obviously feels like she's living in her shadow. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's interesting to see, you know, like, how frustrated he is mm-hmm. by by his lack of education, especially knowing that that's who his ex-wife, that that's who his previous wife is. Yeah, I also wonder if it's one of those things, too, where it's, like, if it made him feel like less of a man because she's smarter than he was oh definitely yeah yep i agree i agree and that's the thing about margaret too is that margaret is perfectly okay with accepting the status quo for her station Mm -hmm. she's okay with being you know a woman of that time like she's okay with her husband calling the shots because and i mean it, it allows her to kind of exercise even more control over her son absolutely but that's all we have time for today candace where can people of the internet find you if you would like to be found everybody you can find me um at candace the magnificent on instagram all one word um as well as uh youtube i do some content on my own time recently i've been on an ice cream review kick so please head over there and check me out uh, you can also find me um, at Valor Studios, V-A-L-O-R-E. I am one of their cast members of Deadlands, a tabletop role-playing game uh, vlog that airs on Twitch on Wednesday nights. And then uh, the episodes are uploaded onto YouTube on Fridays. And uh, you can also, hopefully soon, find me um, on Spotify. Dungeon Jedi Masters has a new show coming out called Scattered Choices, and I play Tula Batunde. So by the time we air this, it should be up.
Thank you all so much for listening to this episode of the Barely Bookish Podcast. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, this month we'll be covering The Witcher on uh, Patreon. So if you want to join the Patreon, uh, please consider going and donating over there. It's patreon.com slash barelybookish. Uh, you can jo for, join for as low as $3 a month and get early access to every episode as well as um, get exclusive bonus content. Uh, and I'm hoping to add more fun things, probably make some goals here soon. But yeah, please consider joining. Uh, it helps this podcast a whole lot. Also, um, I am streaming over on Twitch more, so make sure to go join me on Twitch so that you can see my face instead of just hearing me talk, which is a fun new experience for us all, truly. Um, yeah, that's kind of all my real big announcements. I got a Kindle now, which is fun weird i am going to have to see how i feel about it uh, i haven't quite decided yet so you know i'll let y'all know check my instagram to see how i feel about a kindle but i hope you all are having a great winter so far um florida's weather's been kind of wild but i'm sure it's gonna warm up in like three seconds so yeah thank you all so much for listening to this episode i will catch you all next week uh with even more kindred um yeah, our logo was designed by my little sibling, Sarah. Our theme song was by Raphael Crux. And I'll catch you all later. Bye!